Hello, everybody. Um, yes, indeed, I am the last speaker of the day and indeed the conference, which is a great honor. Uh, but also, I think it's tradition that the final speaker has to say that, oh, I'm the last thing standing between you and going out to get a beer, right? Uh, that is true. However, what I would like to point out is that you are the only thing standing between me and going out and getting a beer. <laughs> uh, so I am here today to talk to you, which when you think about it is kind of weird, on two counts. First of all, that I am here standing on the stage that was clearly some error by Dries or Freak, I don't know, but here I am. But also I'm going to talk to you. And when you stop and think about it, I'm, I'm going to stand here. I'm going to move this, uh, this jaw up and down. I'm going to wave this flappy piece of muscle around inside my mouth and vibrate air over my vocal cords. And I'll do that for the next 30, 40 minutes. And you're all just going to sit there and take it. I mean, that's kind of weird. I mean, in this case, I'm not just vibrating the air between us. I guess it's being mitigated by being, I'm vibrating the air in front of this little microphone, which then gets transmitted as a signal to that speaker. The speaker vibrates, and that vibrates the air. So we're just sitting here in a room for 30, 40 minutes listening to the air being vibrated, which is, which is kind of a strange activity when you think about it. But of course, the reason why, why I can do this, and why you're just going to sit there and take it, is that I'll be using language. And hopefully, we're all speaking the same code base when it comes to language. In this case, it's English. But I'm, I mean, I'm using language in its broader sense, not just a specific language. I'm using the, the ability that we have as humans to use language, which is maybe the defining characteristic of our species. And we're not quite sure when this characteristic emerged, maybe about 50,000 years ago, the great leap forward. And, and through language, being able to move the jaw up and down and flap your piece of meat around and vibrate air over your vocal cords, uh, you can revisit the past. I can tell you about something that's happened in the past. Uh, or more excitingly, I could tell you about something that might happen in the future. And you could picture that in your head. So, so language is, is a kind of time travel. It allows us to visit the past and the future. Um, more fundamentally, it's a form of communication, right? I, can, I might have some piece of information, and through moving my jaw up and down and vibrating the air and flapping this piece of flesh, I transfer the information from inside of my head to inside of your head. So from that point of view, language is, is kind of like a virus in that it's, it's pretty much unconscious. You can't prevent yourself from doing it. For example, if I say, don't think of an elephant, Immediately, you've thought of an elephant. It's, it's involuntary. That's kind of the language equivalent of the, the visual game of the chicken game, which you've just played and lost. Uh, that, idea, that, that sentence, don't think of an elephant, that's actually the name of a, a book by uh, George Lakoff, who's written uh, many books on language. He's a linguist. And one of the books he wrote, uh, along with uh, Women of Fire and Dangerous Things, is Metaphors We Live By, back in 1980. And he's particularly interested in how we use metaphor in language. And we, use, we use conceptual metaphor all the time, especially when we want to talk about something that's intangible. We'll talk about the intangible thing in terms of something that's tangible. So a classic example is time. Time is intangible. But we'll talk about time as though it's a physical object moving in space. Right? We'll talk about time flies or time drags. Or we'll talk about time as though it's a resource. We'll talk about uh, saving time or wasting time. Now, the truth is you can't do any of these verbs with time because time is this intangible thing. But this helps us get a, a, a grasp on, on time, allows us to talk about the intangible things in terms of something tangible. That's what conceptual metaphor does. But what George Lakoff was particularly interested in was cognitive metaphors, uh, in particular the idea of political language, in that the way we frame what we're talking about can subconsciously have an effect on the subsequent discussion. So uh, a good example is if you're about to have a debate on tax relief, before the debate has even begun, taxation has been framed as something that you need relief from. Right? So that's a classic example of political language. I think we do it ourselves as well. And when we're working on the web, we'd find ourselves talking about, isn't it amazing what you can do today in the browser? The browser, singular. 
as though there aren't multiple browsers. And subtly, maybe that's reinforcing an idea of a, a monoculture in the web browser space. I don't know. So I'm very interested to know what cognitive metaphors we're using when we talk about our work, particularly our work on the web, which is an intangible thing. How do we describe the work we do in this very new and very young medium? So there was another new and young medium that, that tackled the same question. Uh, has anyone read the book Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud? No, it's a really good book, and it is also a comic book, uh, self-describing. Uh, so he published this in 1993, and he's explaining what comics are. And, in, and again, a, a relatively young and new medium. And he talks about how any medium, when it's new, when it's young, it takes on the tropes of the medium that came before. So each new medium begins its life by imitating its predecessors. How many early movies were like film stage players, and early television was just like radio with pictures. Right? So this seems a natural thing. When you've got a new medium, you, you talk about it in terms of the medium before. You borrow the metaphors of the medium before. Now, this reminded me of something. When I read this in Scott McCloud's book, I remember this very same point being made in an article about the web. And it was this article, A Tao of Web Design, was written by John Alsop in the year 2000 on a list apart. Has anybody read A Tao of Web Design? Yeah, OK, Bram's read it. Good stuff. And a few other people. Good, good. I highly recommend reading this. Because um, it might seem strange that I'm standing on the stage in 2019 recommending you go read an article from the year 2000. But the amazing thing is how well this article has stood the test of time. In fact, if anything, I think it's maybe more relevant now than when it was written. And in this article, John also makes exactly the same point that Scott McCloud was making about comics, except he's talking about the web, a new young medium, and how on the web, we tend to borrow from the previous medium. Uh, but he says this about that, that situation. He says, quote, when a new medium borrows from an existing one, some of what it borrows makes sense, but much of the borrowing is thoughtless, ritual, and often constrains the new medium. And over time, the new medium develops its own conventions, throwing off existing conventions that don't make sense, end quote. So in the web, the early days of the web, it's the 1990s, I'm trying to get a grip on what this new medium is from a, from a design standpoint. Well, the medium that came before was print. And so it made sense to look to the world of print. In fact, there was uh, this book, Creating Killer Websites by David Siegel, published in 1996, which was basically all about trying to regain that same sense of control that designers were familiar with from print and get that same level of control in, in, on the web. David Siegel is the guy who invented the idea of using tables for layout, using a single transparent one pixel by one pixel spacer GIF to make layouts. If none of that makes any sense to you and you're not familiar with any of that, good, good. This is ancient history and stuff we don't have to do anymore. Uh, years later, he published an essay called uh, The Web is Broken and I Broke It, which is maybe overstating the case. Um, but John Alsop talking about this idea of killer websites, you know, looking to print and getting the same sense of control. This is what John Alsop said in the Tao of Web Design. He says, the web is a new medium, although it has emerged from the medium of printing, whose skills, design language, and conventions strongly influence it. Yet it is too often shaped by that from which it sprang. Killer websites are usually those which tame the wildness of the web and constrain pages as if they were made of paper. Desktop publishing for the web. So John is acknowledging here that yes, we can absolutely learn from the history of print. And before print, you know, illuminated manuscripts. We can see here the evolution in, in design, drop caps, grid systems, right up to the, the Swiss school in the 20th century. Uh, this is, you know, I think the next great leap forward for our species after language was writing. Because now it's possible to transmit thoughts like a virus, and we don't even need to be in the same physical space. Somebody can put an idea in your head by writing it down, and they might not even be alive by the time you read what they've read. So writing, printing, amazing stuff. And absolutely, we can learn from it. Um, but John is saying that the web is something different, something more again, and we shouldn't be constrained by the metaphors and, and the ideas we've taken from print. 
So what, what seems to be happening is here, you've got this debate with two very different sides. On the one side, you've got David Siegel, who's talking about rigidity and control and constraining things on the web, because that's what we're used to from print. And on the other side, you've got John also talking about the Tao of web design and the flexibility of the web and things being in flux and moving. And these seem to be two very opposite uh, ends of, of, a, of a spectrum here. And yet, John Alsop and David Siegel are in agreement on something. And what they're in, in agreement on is the language they use to talk about the web. Because all, while all this is going on, they're talking about websites, web sites, which is something we've used from the earliest days of web, this term. And yet, a web thing can't have a site. It has no physical location, right? But we use this idea of a site like a building site, like a construction site. Uh, in fact, in the early days, we literally used to acknowledge that our websites were under construction all the time. I'll give you the full nostalgic effect. Yes, that's, that's what it was like. Um, we stopped putting these banners on our websites, but if we were going to be truthful, maybe we'd acknowledge that all websites are under construction. So I'm really interested in looking at these metaphors we use to talk about the work we do and whether maybe that might unconsciously influence the work we do. So here's a metaphor that I've come across many times when people are talking about the work they do on the web. They will describe themselves as being architects. Does anybody here have architect in their job title? A few people, right, yeah, fine, this it makes sense, like you're the architect of whatever, solutions or systems or any of these things. Also, it sounds cool because architects are cool. Uh, I blame Hollywood for reinforcing this idea. Like in any Hollywood film, the architect is always likable. The architect is never the villain, right? It's become like a shorthand for oh, a likable person, an architect. Uh, but also, we can learn from the discipline of architecture, like real-world architecture. Although, if you talk to people in the architecture industry, they talk about how terrible it is. Like, it's nothing but spec work and, and prizes, and uh, it's not good. But I know many UX designers who would say that this is the best book about UX design they've ever read. 101 Things I Learned in Architecture School by Matthew Frederick. It's not about UX design. It is about architecture. And yet there's so many transferable lessons that the field of UX design can learn directly from, from architecture. So here's an example of a book from one discipline having an influence in a, in a different, more intangible discipline. Here's a book that's definitely had an influence, not just on the web, but before the web, I would say on software in general, A Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander. This is a classic book. The definition of a classic book is a book that everyone's heard of and nobody has read. Uh, this is supposed to be about architecture, about making things modular and reusable, but boy, did it ever take off in the world of software, right? Uh, Ward Cunningham, who invented the wiki, he cites this as a direct influence on his thinking. And of course, the gang of four with their design patterns, right? Elements of reusable object-oriented software it was basically taking these ideas from Christopher Alexander in the world of architecture and transferring them directly to software. Reusability, componentization, modularization. Um, although interesting enough, there's a book by uh, Molly Wright Steenson where she looks directly at uh, the world of architecture and product design and looks for the influence in digital realms like the web and software. And she points out that actually, um, uh, a pattern language has had way more influence in the world of software and the web than it ever did in architecture. Like, most architects don't like Christopher Alexander. They think he's kind of preachy. Uh, but in the world of the web, oh boy, has it had an influence. And I can attest to this because, I mean, modularity, components, reusability, design systems, right? So hot right now. Everyone's got their design systems. Uh, in fact, I organized an event all around design systems called Patterns Day. We had two of them in Brighton and invited all these great speakers. That is Gina Ann and Ala Kolmatova and these great speakers. And by the end of the day, I was saying that, you know, really we should have had a drinking game going on throughout the day, which was that any time somebody referenced a pattern language by Christopher Alexander, you'd have to take a drink. Uh, in fact, the, here's the full drinking game I came up with. Any time someone references Christopher Alexander, take a drink. Anytime someone says Lego, take a drink. Anytime someone says naming things is hard, 
take a drink. Anytime someone says atomic or atomic design, take a drink. And anyone t anytime someone says uh, bootstrap, then you can uh, puke the drink back up. <laughs> There's another book from the world of architecture that's definitely had an influence on, on my brain. It's lesser known, I think, than Christopher Alexander's book. Uh, but it's called How Buildings Learn by Stuart Brand. Again, a classic book. Um, you've heard of it. No one's read it. I haven't read it. But it, the ideas in it have had a, a big influence on me. There's a, there's a corresponding television show to go with this as well um, from 1994. Uh, and it's fascinating. And in this book, uh, Stuart Brand uh, looks at the work of a British architect named Frank Duffy. And Frank Duffy has an idea. And Frank Duffy says that a building properly conceived is several layers of longevity. Now, he called these layers shearing layers. And his point was that you, you have different time scales at work here. So the site that a building sits on, you're talking about a geological time scale. And then the actual structure of the building, well, you know, hopefully that's centuries long. And then you get into the skin, the outside, you're going to change that every few decades, the infrastructure inside every few years, until you get down to the level of stuff, the furniture inside a room that you can move around on a daily basis. So you've got these different layers of time happening there, from the site all the way through to the stuff. What I find interesting, though, is, one, this idea of layers of time, shearing layers, but also the way that each layer depends on the layer before. And that you cannot have a structure until you've got a site to put it on. You can't have stuff inside a room until you've got the walls and the doors and the windows that define what a room is. So it's like there's layers of dependency going on here as well as the layers of time, that certain things need to exist before the next shearing layer can even exist. And that reminds me of something else I'd come across in the work of Stephen Johnson, uh, who writes about innovation, like where good ideas come from. And he talks about this idea of the adjacent possible, how certain things need to be in place before an innovation or an invention can take place, right? Why, you know, um, the microwave oven couldn't have been invented in medieval Belgium because too many other steps had to happen before the microwave. And you could see that with, you know, the World Wide Web. Before the World Wide Web can exist, we, we have to have industrialization in order to have electricity, in order to have the kind of circuitry we need to make computers, and then we have to have some kind of network of computers before we get the World Wide Web. And you can keep going, right? In order for Facebook or Google to exist, there has to be a World Wide Web which requires an internet, which requires computers, which requires circuitry. So this is the idea of the adjacent possible. Now, so we've got shearing layers from architecture, and this idea of the adjacent possible kind of matching up as well, of these, these kind of layers of dependency. Well, Stuart Brand revisited the idea of shearing layers a few years later, after How Buildings Learn. He wrote a book called The Clock of the Long Now. Because Stuart Brand is one of the founding members of the Long Now Foundation. Has anybody heard of the Long Now Foundation? A few people, any members of the Long Now Foundation? Uh, okay, so it's an organization dedicated to long-term thinking. Uh, if you go on the website, you'll notice that every time they write a year on the website, it's written with five digits instead of four. There's like a leading zero in front of the, you know, be 02019 for this year. Well, you know, avoiding the, the Y10K problem. Um, but in this book, he's talking about the, the, probably the most famous project, the clock is long. Now, this is a clock that will tell time for 10,000 years. Uh, and in this book, Clock of the Long Now, Time and Responsibility, the ideas behind the world's slowest computer, he takes the idea of shearing layers and abstracts it out, away from architecture, and applies it to, well, just about anything. That these, this idea of layers of longevity could be applied to anything you, you could think of, any kind of system. And he calls this pace layers. Now, he, he gives an example of pace layers in action by looking at our species, how we have these different time scales. So there's our fundamental nature, our physiological nature, you know, our DNA. That hasn't changed for tens of thousands of years. Physiologically, there's no difference between you know, a caveman and a spaceman. They're, they're the same kind of human. You've got culture, which accumulates over centuries. right? Then you've got models of governance, not governments, but governance, like whether we're going to have a feudal system or a monarchy or a representative democracy. Right? And you get into the infrastructure, and that tends to move that bit faster. Commerce, now we're moving faster again, until you get to fashion, which is deliberately supposed to move very fast and, and do things quickly. It would be very boring if fashion moves slowly. Fashion meaning you know, pop music as well. Anything that's 
that's meant to move fast. So you get these, these kind of states of, of, of longevity here, from nature all the way up to fashion. And, and talking about these layers, these pace layers, Stuart Brand describes the difference between, say, the top and the bottom. He says, fast learns, but slow remembers. Fast proposes, right? What about this? What about that? Try this. No, try that. But slow disposes. And fast is discontinuous. Slow is continuous. Fast and small instructs slow and big by a crude innovation and occasional revolution. But slow and big controls small and fast by constraint and constancy. And fast gets all our attention, but slow has all the power. Now, this idea of pace layers, when I was introduced to it, uh, it kind of ruined my life in the sense that I just keep seeing them everywhere, right? It's like when, when you're exposed, you know, like, uh, if you want to ruin someone's life, you, you teach them about typography and kerning, right? Because then you just can't unsee bad kerning everywhere you look, right? You just can't, it's, it's like the way you, you can't unsee the arrow in the FedEx logo, right? Once somebody's pointed out the arrow, then every time you see the FedEx van go by, it's like, I, I see the arrow. Um, or to use a more European example, which you're all familiar with this, the, the Toblerone logo, right? You all, see the, you all see the bear, right? Right? You knew that one already, right? Well, now you, you can't unsee it. It's like, it's in, you see the bear? You see, you see it? No? Is anyone, okay, good. Just checking, just checking. All right, well, how about this? Consider the duck. It's perfectly... Normal, ordinary duck, I think we all agree, yes? But then you're on the internet and uh, you read that all ducks are actually wearing dog masks. <laughs> all ducks are actually wearing dog masks. And now, when I show you the same picture of the same duck, <laughs> you can't unsee that. Well, that's what it's like with pace layers for me. Like, I, just, I just can't unsee them. I see pace layers everywhere now, and I try to abstract every kind of system into its kind of layers. It's become a joke at, at work at the Clear Left Studio. It's like time till pace layers, you know. Um, but here's, here's what I've done. I've taken our work, the World Wide Web, and tried to abstract it into a system of pace layers. I think it kind of works. I think this could work. So at the lowest level, you're building something on the web, then it's going to be on the internet. And the internet is run on TCP IP at the very, very, very lowest level. Now, TCP IP, the transmission control protocol, internet protocol, that exists since the, the 70s when Bob Kahn and Vint Cerf created these super simple low-level protocols and pretty much unchanged since then. Then on top of that low-level protocol, we have the protocol we use for the web, HTTP. Now, this has evolved over time. We have HTTP2. Uh, right, HTTPS, um, but it hasn't been quick, right? The, the evolution of HTTP has been slow, and that feels right. It feels like we wouldn't want HTTP to be something that changes too quickly. Now then, on top, what we're serving over HTTP is URLs, and I wish we could put URLs down at the bottom layer. I wish URLs were just like forever, uh, but I must acknowledge that no, you have to actually work to keep URLs alive over a long time. Um, they are not long-lasting unless you care for them, but we can take care of them. Uh, what do you put at that URL? You put HTML. Now, HTML has changed over time. When HTML was first introduced, you know, Tim Berners-Lee had a document called HTML Tags. It was like 26 elements, most of them borrowed from SGML, and now we got over 126 elements in, in HTML. So it's, it's grown and grown, but it doesn't feel like it's been an overwhelming growth. I mean, the last kind of spurt of growth was with HTML5, and that's, that's a decade ago now, so I feel like it's not, it's not too overwhelming to keep up to date with the pace of change with HTML. Now, CSS moves faster, no doubt about it, and it's been pretty exciting in CSS lately with things like Grid and Flexbox and new things landing. Uh, but again, I feel like I'm on top of it. I feel like I can handle the pace of change. And then you have the JavaScript ecosystem. I don't mean JavaScript the language. We heard about the things changing there. It feels like the pace is actually pretty good in the language itself. No, I mean JavaScript and its environment, as in the, the build tools, the frameworks, the libraries. Um, I don't know about you, but 
I find it incredibly overwhelming. We're like, I, I'm just about to try and use something and find out, no, no, that's so out of date, that's so last week, we stopped using that. We don't use that library anymore, we use this library, we don't use that task manager, we use this one, we don't use, you know, it's, it's, it's really overwhelming. But I realized when I plotted them on these pace layers, and if it's op occupying that same layer that you have, you know, for fashion, well, that, this is supposed to be fast moving. This is actually kind of reassuring. That I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the pace of change at the JavaScript ecosystem layer, but the whole point of JavaScript is to propose, right? Fast proposes, slow disposes. Try this, no, try that. What about this? Try this one. That's the whole idea. In fact, the way that you know, fast proposes, slow disposes over time, the good ideas will even make their way down into the, the slower layers. Like, I remember the earliest uses of JavaScript were doing things like uh, image rollovers, right? You do it in Dreamweaver and then underscore image rollover. Uh, or you would do form validation, right? Uh, has that required field actually been filled in? Let's have some JavaScript for that. Does that actually look like an email address? And these days, I would not use JavaScript for either of those two use cases. Because if I was doing rollovers, I would just use CSS. We have colon hover now. And if I was doing form validation, I would say input type equals email. Required. Done. So we figured this stuff out in JavaScript, and then the good stuff kind of moves down. And that's a pattern you see over and over again uh, in the front end, you know, uh, responsive images. Well, we figure it out in JavaScript, and then the solution makes its way down into HTML. So JavaScript is kind of meant to be where we try stuff out. What about this? What about that? Now, when I looked at this kind of plot of these layers of the, the web's front end stack, I realized this also kind of maps to how I approach building websites. I mean, I pretty much take the existence of the network for granted that we're building on the internet. So HTTP, okay, fine. But URL first design, that's actually a pretty good way to design something, especially APIs. If you're doing API design, URL first design is the way to go. And thinking about the structure of your content first, the HTML, that makes a lot of sense. You know, we heard about the accessibility of well-structured HTML this morning from Sarah. And then, and only then, thinking about the presentation, how you want this to look, and then finally, the behavior on top of that. So me personally, that's, that's my stack. Is, is these layers of technologies, one building on top of the layer below. But it is a testament to the flexibility of the web that if you don't want to build in this layered way, you don't have to. You have that choice. In fact, if you wanted, you could build like this. Still gonna assume it's going out over the internet and it's going out over HTTP or HTTPS, but just do everything in JavaScript, right? Um, URLs, routing URLs, why not do that on the client side? Uh, the structure, the DOM, the actual what gets generated for the user, let's, let's spit that out using, using JavaScript. CSS, in JS, why not? Um, this is basically the architecture of single page apps, right? Where it's on the internet and then everything is in JavaScript. The routing, the uh, document structure, the styling, everything in JavaScript. Like I say, that is your choice. You can choose to build in this way. I'm not a fan of this particular stack um, because of the way it kind of turns what you're building into a, a binary choice. It turns into this kind of stack where, yeah, we're on the internet, and if there's JavaScript, everything's going to be fine. But though that's, that's your only choice, is that either it works great or it doesn't work at all. It's a binary choice. Now, in another medium, this makes complete sense. If, for example, I'm building a native app, and I, uh, I build an iOS app, and you have an iOS device, then you get 100% of what I've designed and built. But if I build an iOS app and you have an Android device, you can't install it. You can't put an iOS app on an Android device. You get 0% of what I've built. Either it worked great or it doesn't work at all. But the web doesn't have to be like that. If I build in a layered way, then we could take something that you know, just about works, maybe it's just plain old HTML, and start layering on more things with CSS, with JavaScript, within those layers to make it work better, make it work well, make it work great. So I design and build something on the web, and if I build in this layered way, then you know, maybe you don't get 100% of what I've designed and built, but you probably won't get 0% either. You'll get something along the way, hopefully closer to the top, right? This feels like a very resilient way to build. And on the web, it maps so very nicely to our stack. This I would consider a full stack. 
right? The technologies on the front end alone. And this layered way is a way of providing resilience on the web. I'm not the only one who thinks about this layered approach. I'll quote Ethan Marcotte. Ethan said, I like designing in layers. I love looking at the design of a page, a pattern, whatever, and thinking about how it will change if, say, fonts aren't available, or JavaScript doesn't work, or someone doesn't see the design as you and I might, and is having the page read aloud to them. That inbuilt resilience. Now, Ethan Marcotte, you'd probably be familiar with from this article, Responsive Web Design, which was also published on a list apart. Uh, the year two th 2010, 10 years after John Alsop's article, A Dial of Web Design. And one of the first things Ethan does in the article is he references John Alsop's A Dial of Web Design article from 10 years before, building on top of it, if you will, building in layers. And he introduces us to this new term, this new metaphor of responsive web design, which he takes directly from the world of architecture. Responsive design came from architecture, the idea of buildings that would respond to the people within them. So architecture has actually had a pretty you know, rich seam of ideas for us to borrow from, from Christopher Alexander to Stuart Brand to, to responsive design. Maybe it's influenced in a, in a positive way. So what about other metaphors that we use when we're talking about the work we do? Well, here's one. There wasn't that many people put up their hands when I asked who had architect in their job title. Uh, who has engineer in their job title? Raise your hand, please. Okay, quite a few engineers in the room. Great. Um, I mean, I'm assuming you're not mechanical engineers. You're probably not chemical engineers. Software engineers, right? Um, I have a soft spot for the term software engineering. Uh, not because I think it's a particularly good metaphor, but because of where the term comes from. The term comes from Margaret Hamilton. She was the first person to popularize this. And this is software engineering. So Margaret Hamilton uh, was writing the code for the Apollo command capsule uh, going to the moon. And an amazing achievement. The code that would literally be woven together in the computer. And the Apollo landings, if you think about it, the, the perfect mix of amazing code, uh, amazing human beings, and amazing hardware. It's like software, hardware, and humans. This almost perfect cybernetic system. Um, this, by the way, this photo taken on Apollo 11, uh, the Apollo 11 uh, uh, mission, July 20th, it's, it's, a, it's an unusual photograph. You're familiar with the concept of a selfie, as the young folks call it, right? A portrait, a, a, photogra a photograph where the person taking the photograph is also in the photograph. This is one of the few examples of an everyone else because the photograph contains uh, Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and every single human being alive at the time within the frame of the picture, except for Michael Collins, who was taking the picture, and everyone else. So engineering as a metaphor, does it work when it comes to software, when it comes to the web? Well, let's abstract what engineering is about. I think if you're an engineer, if you're, your fundamental concerns are kind of about two things, the, the materials you're working with and the tools you're going to use to get your work done. Uh, regardless of whether it's chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, any other kind of engineering. So let's see if this would apply to the web. And again, I'm talking specifically about the web because that's the area I know. And, and I'm going to be even more specific and say the front end of the web because, again, I'm not a full stack developer, although, as I pointed out, the front end is itself quite a full stack. And here it is. Here is the full stack of front end technologies, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, hopefully in that order. So those are the materials you work with. Like, no matter what tools you use, what's going to get served up to the end users ultimately is going to be HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Maybe it's mostly JavaScript. Maybe it's mostly HTML. It, those are the materials. So what about the tools we use to design and build on the web? Well, the very obvious tools are literally design tools, tools that have been designed to design, Photoshop, Sketch, all of that. I think we should acknowledge on any project there are also require tools around communication, around productivity, that you do need email and Slack and calendars, right? We call these productivity tools, even though sometimes it feels they sap productivity rather than add to it. Um, if you think about it, the term productivity tool is, is an oxymoron in that all tools are productivity tools. The very definition of a tool is something that increases productivity. So I think we should acknowledge that these tools are, are required to build anything on the web. Um, 
And then specifically on the, you know, the web front end stack, there's this whole kind of group of tools we use, not in the web browser, but more on our own computers, right, to get stuff done. So these are the preprocessors, the postprocessors, the task runners, the build tools, the version control, right, all these things, all the things that help us write HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, so when it comes to these things, because they sit on our machines and they aren't ever shipped to the end user, my attitude is use whatever you want, right? As long as the end result is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, they don't have a direct impact on the end user. They have two degrees of separation of impact, right? If they help you work faster, then you're gonna make better websites, that's better for the user. But in terms of direct impact on the user, they don't matter that much. But they really matter to you in terms of productivity. You, your team, choose what you want. I have to say I find this to be kind of like that JavaScript top layer of the shearing layer. It's just like I get really overwhelmed by the rate of change here in terms of like build tools and task managers and, and all that stuff. Uh, does anyone else feel overwhelmed by the rate of change of these kind of tools? Okay, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up and look around the room uh, just to see you're not alone, okay? You're not alone. This is, the way I feel about it sometimes, I, 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 I get that they're necessary, and particularly working at scale, but sometimes it feels like they've become the default way, like just to put a website online. It feels like it's maybe got a bit overcomplicated. Um, it reminds me, do you remember there was that startup called Juicero, where it was a big expensive machine for making juice, and you'd buy expensive packets of juice, of, you know, material, and you'd put them into the expensive machine that produced juice. Uh, that's what some of these things feel like to me especially when somebody pointed out that you could just take the packet of juice and squeeze it by hand, and it still worked. I'm just saying, you can squeeze by hand. It's still an option. I know if you're making juice for one or two people, you can squeeze by hand. It's not gonna scale if you have thousands of people who need their juice just in time. Uh, and here, in describing that, I am clearly reaching the limits of metaphor, so we'll, we'll leave that one behind. There's another sort of balance here between the materials and the tools in terms of when you're choosing the tools, I think. Priorities, and it's between users and the engineers themselves. User experience and developer experience. I worry that we overvalue the developer experience when really I think the user experience has gotta be the first and foremost uh, question when we're choosing tools. Now, if we are choosing a tool, we're choosing a technology, there are questions to ask. Like you ask, how well does it work? That seems a reasonable question. You're about to use some technology, how well does it work? That is a reasonable question, but then Bram hinted at this yesterday. I think there's a better question to ask, and that's this. How well does it fail? Because if something fails well, then you get to fall back to something below, right? That's, we'll go back to that kind of resilience. And this is why this layered approach, I think, works so well, certainly for me, is that it fails really well. If something goes wrong at the tippy top stack, because the error handling model of JavaScript is quite brittle compared to the error handling model of HTML and CSS, then things can fall back right, to the layer below. And it happens within the layers as well. You want to use some CSS that isn't supported in every browser? just go ahead and use it, because the browsers will automatically fall back to just ignoring CSS they don't understand. Same goes for HTML. So this idea of, of you know, considering the, the, the layered approach, I think aligns nicely with a principle, and this aligns to this question, how well does it fail? This is a principle that influenced the design of the World Wide Web itself, and it's the principle of least power. The principle of least power states that you should choose the least powerful language suitable for a given purpose. Now this seems really counterintuitive. Why would I choose the least powerful language? It's kind of like, you know, why would I choose boring technology? Because the least powerful language is likely to be simpler, more resilient, uh, and continue to work. Whereas the more powerful language, that power tends to come at a cost, and the cost can be fragility. So uh, I'm gonna quote uh, Derek Featherstone, Bram also quoted yesterday. Derek Featherstone is an accessibility expert, and he said, in the web front-end stack, that's HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and ARIA, if you can solve a problem with a simpler solution lower in the stack, you should. It's less fragile, it's more foolproof, and it just works. So again, we're back to the idea of you know, fragility and resilience. 
and that building in a layered way encourages resilience over fragility. And I think the principle of least power is a great principle for the web, especially when it's combined with another principle that's a, a law of nature, really, and that's Murphy's Law, that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Uh, I think we need to acknowledge this. Uh, Murphy was a real person. Edward Aloysius Murphy was an aerospace engineer. And because he had this attitude, nobody died on his watch. And other industries with engineers do take Murphy's Law into account. They consider the worst case scenarios. Yeah, you hope for the best, but you prepare for the worst. The auto industry will strap crash test dummies into cars and smash them into walls at high speed. You know, could, you, could you imagine if they said, we've been looking at the data, and on average, yeah, we realize we don't need to strap crash test dummies into cars and smash them into walls at high speed, because data shows that mostly our cars are driven by human beings, not crash test dummies. Secondly, they're mostly driving on roads and not smashing the cars into walls at high speed. True, but you need to prepare for the worst. And admittedly, the auto industry weren't initially doing that, and it's only through to, due to regulation that they strap crash test dummies into cars and smash them into walls at high speed. But I feel like this is something we could do on the web, particularly if you're going to call yourself an engineer. You need to hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Here's what Trent Walton, uh, a designer, web designer, said about this. He said, like cars designed to perform in extreme heat or on icy roads, websites should be built to face the reality of the web's inherent variability. The reality of the web's inherent variability. Now that goes right back to what John Alsop was talking about 19 years ago in a DAO web design. The unknowns, the flexibility, you can't control this. You have to prepare for what you can't control. And if we're calling ourselves engineers and we're not taking this attitude, I'm not sure we can do that. In fact, you know, whenever a discussion of engineering comes up as a metaphor, bridges always seem to, to, to come up as a comparing. It's like building a bridge, you know, the architect of the bridge, the engineers of the bridge. Well, I've got a story about a bridge. This is a specific bridge. This is the Quebec Bridge, a cantilever bridge, Quebec in Canada. Uh, construction started in 1904. There was, of course, it's the architecture business, there was a competition. And the winning firm uh, had Theodore Cooper as the engineer in charge. And one of the first things he did after the winning entry was he lengthened the bridge from 490 meters to 550 meters, basically because he wanted to be the longest bridge in the world. Um, but he didn't recalculate the already high stresses being placed on the bridge when he increased the length. Oh, a couple of other things to bear in mind. Theodore Cooper was based in New York, and he refused to work on site in Quebec, in Canada. And when it was suggested that other people could go over his numbers and verify them, he took great offense at that. There would be no code reviews on this project. So 1907, construction's underway. A young engineer named Norman McClure, he reported some bending on August 6th, 1907. And again on August 27th, it had gotten a lot worse. So uh, they were informing Cooper down in New York that the, the, the steel is bending. And Cooper sent back a telegram. He said, place no more load on Quebec Bridge until all facts considered. Stop. But he didn't explicitly say, stop working on the bridge. And so the telegram was kind of ignored, and they carried on working. And it was just a, a day or two later, right before the end of the workday, like the whistle was just about to blow to signal the end of work when the bridge collapsed, August 29th, 1907. 75 of the 85 workers died. Something interesting started happening in Canada after this, 1925. Canadian engineering schools started holding private ceremonies, separate from qualifications. This wasn't a qualification ceremony. This was called the ritual of the calling of the engineer. And in the ceremony, you would speak an obligation scripted by Rudyard Kipling. And also, you would be given an iron ring, which was a symbol, a metaphor, if you will. A symbol of pride, yes, but also of humility. And you'd wear it on the, on the little finger of your working hand, so it would brush against the paper or the keyboard as you worked, a constant reminder of your responsibility as an engineer. So 
when we call ourselves engineers, I don't think we've earned it. I certainly wouldn't want to call myself a software engineer in Canada. So, if we're not engineers, not architects, what are we? What metaphor do we use? Well, maybe, you know, going all the way back to those under construction gifts, maybe we're builders. I mean, is that so bad? We're just putting stuff together, you know, brick layers, collaborating, making amazing things by building. Christopher Alexander, when he was talking about a pattern language, he said part of his inspiration was, he said, most of the wonderful places of the world were not made by architects, but by the people. I know we like to think we're architects, we're engineers, but what if we're just bricklayers, putting bricks one on top of the other? I mean, if what you're building is amazing, then what a privilege. And I do think the World Wide Web is amazing. I think it is the next leap forward. After language, then writing, now we have the World Wide Web, from the printing press to hypertext, and we get to work on it with amazing building blocks, the bricks of the World Wide Web. Think about the simple hypertext, the ability to link two things together, because all you need is the URLs. I can make a document on the web that links to a document over there and a document over there, and this is the first time those two things have been linked together in history. And I can just do that, and I don't need to ask anyone for permission. It's boring technology, but I find it very exciting. So maybe we are bricklayers. Maybe it doesn't matter what we call ourselves, maybe it matters what we build. And we have the power as the bricklayers. If you find yourself working on something that maybe shouldn't exist, you can also throw a brick through the window of your workplace. I'm reminded of a, an apocryphal story from medieval times, I'll finish with this, of a, a traveler coming across three workers, three builders, who are putting stones one on top of the other. All three of them are doing exactly the same work. And the traveler asks the first person, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm putting stones one on top of the other. He says to the second uh, builder, what are you doing? He says, I'm making a wall. He says to the third builder, what are you doing? He says, I'm making a cathedral. So again, it doesn't matter whether we call ourselves architects, engineers, or bricklayers. Now, over the last two days, you've heard from some fantastic bricklayers. Bricklayers building websites, building web apps, building businesses, building communities, building the web. And after two days of that, I don't know about you, but my brain is full of ideas and viruses that have been transferred through the air being vibrated. So I think all that's left for me to do is to stop moving my jaw up and down and flapping this piece of muscle around and vibrating the air over my vocal cords and simply say, thank you. Thank you.